Welcome back. We just had a long weekend, uh, Easter weekend, and um, let's use the first few minutes of class today. This is lecture 52. I think um, I think we can finish 8.7 today, but it, it's going to be quite a task to finish it because we haven't looked at the uh, error estimates for Taylor polynomials. But let's start with um, this, since we've had a few days away from this stuff. So we have generated, this is usually the first one, one of the easier ones to generate a Taylor um, series or in this case a Maclaurin series because it's centered at x equals zero. Uh, it does converge for all values of x which makes it nice so we want e to the first, we put in one for x and do what it says to do there on the right side. If we were to write this out uh, other than the kind of the closed form, the sigma notation form, and expanded form, what's the first term of e to the x? x. One. One. Okay, if you put in zero, it'd be x to the zero over zero factorial, so it's one. Put Kelly on the spot, he just walked into class. Uh, Kelly, when n is equal to one, what is the next term? I like the X. How about just X? Does that work? Oh, that's mean and unfair. <laughs> just uncaring, right? Sorry. Uh, but I didn't call him. I didn't call him homeboy. And home, homeboy just walked in. I mean, let's ask him a question. That that would have been uncaring. Okay. What's the next term? Two factorial, right? Which is just two. And I guess we could come back and do that if we wanted to. Then we've kind of got the pattern going, right, for the expanded form. So for any value of x, this is supposed to converge for all values of x. We haven't done this, though, which is why I kind of wanted to start class with this today. Isn't the derivative of e to the x itself e to the x, right? So if this is true, this expanded form, which goes on forever, we ought to be able to take the derivative of the left side, which we think is e to the x, and we better get the same thing on the right side. When we take the derivative of this thing, we better get the same thing. It's kind of an odd function for that to take place anyway. But the question is, is the derivative of 1 plus x Is that still e to the x? Well, let's check it out. It better be. This function, however we write it out, expanded version, closed version, we better be able to get the derivative as itself. What's the derivative of 1? Derivative of x. Okay, it's starting out okay, isn't it? Derivative of x squared over 2 factorial. Well, we can bring the 1 over 2 factorial out in front, right? And then the derivative of x squared is 2x. How are we doing? Still okay? Bring the 1 over 3 factorial out in front. What's the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared, and let's get one more. 1 over 4 factorial. Derivative of x to the fourth. So we've got 1. 2 factorial is just 2, so they reduce. What about 3 over 3 factorial? 2 factorial, two factorial in the denominator. And we've got x squared in the numerator. What about 4 over 4 factorial? 3 factorial. And we have an x cubed. It works, right? It is its own derivative. And you could take the derivative of this. Obviously, higher order derivatives, they're all going to be the same thing. So we can prove this by the definition of derivative with limits and x and h and all that stuff. But here's another way of validating 
that the derivative of e to the x is in fact itself. So that pretty much does away with the question mark. It is. Um, can we take the derivative in its closed form, the sigma notation version, So what should that be? We should have 1 over n factorial. That's all numerical, right? Derivative of x to the n is n x n minus n x to the n minus 1. What are we going to start n at? Could start it at 0, I think, and get away with it, but I think we've done kind of this process the whole way through. We know we're going to lose a term in the derivative, so we can get away with starting n at 1. And how about n over n <coughs> factorial? So it's going to be n over n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way back to 1. So the n's knock out, and what do we have in the denominator? N minus 1 and you may not like the form, but is that equivalent to what we started with? If we want to back it up, how do we kind of back it up and make it exactly equal to this particular version? Well, if we want to start it at 0, then when n is 1 here, we get what? 0 factorial. So if we're starting it at 0, we want this to just be n factorial, right? And if n is 1, this is x to the 1 minus 1, which is x to the 0. Now we're starting n at 0. We want this to be x to the n, which is exactly that, right? So you don't have to change it to make it equivalent. But if you want to show that it is exactly like what we started with, you can kind of back it up by one and write it in its original in its original form. Okay, we did the derivative of sine, right? Kind of the long way. Or we did, um, sorry, the Taylor series with higher order derivatives of sine. And we decided that sine of x was what? Well, let's generate it, okay? It's been a few days. Sine of x, is that an even or an odd function? Uh, mm -hmm. Sine of x is an odd function. So we want odd powers of x and odd factorials. So x to the 1, that's an odd power, and an odd factorial. We actually stop there, and we've got a fairly good approximation for the sine of pi over 6. If you want a kind of a visual of, we know that sine looks like this, roughly. <coughs> so if we stop there, we would have our t1 um, y equals x four values of x near 0 is this line y equals x x over 1 factorial is that pretty darn close to the curve itself four values near 0 these two are pretty close to each other Obviously, they're very different from one another. We've got this oscillating function very, very different from this linear function. But for values near 0, let's say in this area, the curve sine of x and the straight line y equals x are pretty close to each other. How can we make it better? We can make it better by generating more terms to the 
Taylor or McLaurin series. So what's the next term? So we've got our odd powers and odd factorials. Now keep in mind that we really kind of have an old-fashioned alternating series, right? That we've got a positive, a negative, a positive. Keep that in mind when we examine the error associated with Taylor polynomial. So if we stop it at some point in time, we're going to have an error because the only way it's equal to the sign is to let it go on indefinitely. So I think we did that. I think we very quickly also took the derivative of this. Derivative of the left side is cosine. Derivative of the right side should then be this power series, this Taylor series for cosine. I think we did that. We decided that cosine was an even function. When you take derivatives of these terms, you get even powers of x and even factorials, right? I don't think we did this. So today is really kind of more of a fill in the gaps of things in 8.7 that we haven't done yet. Uh, so how do we describe this? Well, we just kind of decided that it's alternating. So let's get an alternating term in there, negative 1, 2, differing powers based on n. I'm starting with n. I don't know that that's what I want to finish with. I can adjust it up or down one depending on whether I want to start with a positive or negative. But let's start with that. How about our powers? When we want to, let's go ahead and decide that we're going to put in n equals zero for our first term. We're trying to generate x to the 1, but also keep in mind that for the next one, we want to generate n equals 3, and for the one after that, n equals, or the exponent is 5, then it's 7. How do you make something jump up by 2? 2n. If you double something, you kind of force them to. But we don't want to just double them. Okay, we want to either go up one or down one. I think in this case, if we go up one, so that generates the n equals zero term. Twice zero is zero, plus one is one. That gives us that one for the first term. Then we get that increasing of two by doubling n and adding one. So now if you put in n equals one, you get two ones, which is two, plus one, which is three, which is what we want, right? for the next term. For n equals 2, 2 twos is 4, plus 1 is 5, so that seems to get us the power. Very fortunately, in this case, the power and the factorial are the same. So if the power is 2n plus 1, what's the factorial? 2n plus, two two n plus two. 1. And do we get the right signs, S-I-G-N signs, the way we have this negative 1 to the n. First term is positive, next second term is negative, and so it does proceed like we want it to proceed. So let's leave that alone. If it didn't, we could adjust it up one or down one to. So does that seem to be kind of a closed form, a sigma notation form for the sine of x? Yes. Okay, I th still think it's worth our time to do cosine. Now, I know we developed cosine by taking the derivative of this side and the derivative of this side. And we kind of said that looks like an even function. It seemed like it was doing what it was supposed to do. But let's take the time, just so we get another one from start to finish. Let's say that our function is, this time, the cosine of x. And we want to use a Taylor, or in this case, Maclaurin series. Gosh, it's been a few days. I can't even remember how that goes. How does kind of a generic 
McLaurin series go? What's in the numerator? All you homeboys and girls, what's in the numerator? <laughs> no? Yeah. For every, okay, the nth derivative of the original function evaluated at zero. A, a or in this case, A is zero, so we're going to use a Maclaurin series. Okay, x minus a, or in this case, x minus zero, which is just x to the <coughs> n, n factorial. And if we wanted to center this, and we probably should do one of these today, this is going to be a catch-all kind of day today, we should look at what a sine or cosine looks like that's not centered at zero. So we're going to need some derivatives. So we'll start with the so-called zeroth derivative, meaning we haven't taken the zero the derivative at all. It's the original function. First derivative, derivative of cosine is derivative of negative sine. and derivative of negative cosine. Sine? Sine? Yes. And several of you put your pens or pencils down because you know that what's going to happen beyond this point. Repeat. It's going to repeat. So it repeats in these blocks of four. Derivative of sine is cosine, and we've got the same thing all over again. So when n is 0, we want the zeroth derivative, the original function at 0. x to the 0 over 0 factorial. When n is 1, we want the first derivative at 0. x to the 1 over 1 factorial. We'll simplify these in a minute. When n is 2, we want the second derivative at 0. x to the 2 over 2 factorial. When n is 3, third derivative, x to the 3 over 3 factorial. We already know that we're going to lose the odd powers and the odd factorials because we know cosine is an even function. We've already seen what it looks like, but I still think it's worth this process here of generating it ourselves. So the first term is what? What's cosine 0, x to the 0 over 0 factorial? That's 1. Negative sine of 0, I don't think we need to go any further with that one. What's negative sine of 0? It's 0. So we lose that term. When n is 2, what's negative cosine of 0? x squared over 2 factorial. And it's negative. Is that right? And if this works like the sine worked, we're going to lose every other term. Sine of 0 is 0. And we would continue. So we should get this cyclical, at least set of coefficients. 1, 0, negative 1, 0. And that process should continue. We know we're going to have higher powers and higher factorials. So the first term is 1. Now we know on the right side we've got to let this thing go forever for it to be an equation. So we know what the cosine looks like. Looks something like this. 
and we were really at this point in time only concerned as we work our way out to the right, what is the cosine like near x equals zero? Well, supposedly, the cosine of x is pretty close to the line y equals one for a while. They look like they are somewhere between here and here. Y equals one, which is not a very complicated function, just like the other one was y equals x. That simple linear equation for values of x near zero is pretty close. Um, let's try it. So cosine of pi over 12, that's pretty small. It's near zero. Somebody use your calculator. Pi, well, let's just see if we can walk through it without a calculator. Uh, pi over 12 is half of pi over 6. Pi over 6 is the equivalent of 30 degrees, so pi over 12 is the equivalent of 15 degrees. Not a very common value. We're, we should be fairly well versed with 30s, 45s, and 60s, all those incremental values all the way around. But this is not one of them, so you might want to enter in 15 degrees or pi over 12 on your calculator. <coughs> what is the, according to this, it should be pretty close to 1, right? 0.9659, am I remembering the right value? That's pretty close to 1. So it didn't do a bad job as long as we're fairly close to x equals zero. But it's not one. We know that that's too much for those values, except this one value at x equals zero. So what do we have? We have minus, and hopefully we can see from the pattern that we established in the repetitive coefficients in blocks of four, And again, the thing that's handy to remember is that cosine is an even function. The first term might throw you off just a tad, but we've got even powers and even factorials. We could back up and say this is x to the 0 over 0 factorial, because 0 is an even number as well. Nicole? Why wouldn't x to the 4 over 4 factorial, why wouldn't that be negative 2? Because we said that n, when n is 3, then that's <coughs> plus 0. Yes. So wouldn't the next one be negative? All right, let's in, analyze the coefficients. So the first coefficient when n was 0 was 1. Then we had a 0. Then we had a negative 1. And then we had another 0. So there's our cycle. So when we get to the next one, we should be starting all over again. So we should have a positive 1. Then to 0 then to negative 1, then to 0. So that, even though we're losing every other term, and it's kind of hard to tell from this list because we have a positive, then two negatives, one of those is going to fall out. So we really are going to have a positive and then a negative. This one's going to fall out. It's going to alternate in that fashion. So if we wanted... Um, to approximate a cosine graph and stop at n equals 2. So we're going to use a Taylor, or in this case, a Maclaurin series, but we're going to stop it at n equals 2. So we would be generating the n equals 0, the n equals 1, and the n equals 2 terms, possibly three terms. So that's not necessarily the number of terms. We could potentially have three. But what are the first three terms? Well, the first term was 1. The second term was 0. And the next term was So there's T2. There's the Taylor or Maclaurin series having been truncated at n equals 2. And in this case, we only have two terms, but we could have potentially three. We lost one because its coefficient was zero. What's that? Our first approximation was kind of 
almost inane that you know we could approximate this oscillatory curve with a straight horizontal line. It did okay for a while. What's this? Parabola that opens down, right? Where does it open down from? Two. From one, right? So we go up to one, and then we've got this parabola that opens down. I don't know if you can visualize it. Probably not on my graph. But if we stop with T2, it looks something like that. Did it do a better job of approximating this, the cosine curve for a longer period of time? Yes, it did. And if you wanted to pick up the next couple of terms and get, well, I don't what's Suppose we said T3. Is that any different? We stopped at N equals 3. We're really going to miss the next term as well, so we'd have to go to T4, right? And if you um, want to see a nice way using animation in Maple, and time permitting this week I'll do this, is set this up and um, bring it in, is look at a curve sine or cosine would be as good as any, and look at the different Taylor uh, polynomials and work your way out to the right and animate this to the point where it gets closer and closer and closer for a longer period of time, and you'll see the Taylor polynomials gradually getting closer and closer to the exact cosine or sine curve, which is itself a Taylor series. So I think we can see a little bit of that with these two. Y equals 1, okay, but not for very long. Here we've got this parabola that opens down one unit up. It stays with the cosine curve a little bit longer. Um, did we do interval of convergence with sine or cosine? Sine. I know we did interval of convergence with e to the x. Did not do sine or cosine. Okay, let's finish up this cosine and then we'll just pick one and do an interval of convergence. So let's write it using the um, sigma notation. It was alternating. We want even powers and even factorials, it doesn't matter which we start with, we'll just, let's say, get the power and we'll use the same thing in the denominator. x to the 2n. Does that give us what we want? When n is 0, it gives us 0, which is, x really, in a sense, doesn't appear. When n is 1, we want the next term to actually reflect that the, it's a even and we're going from x equal, excuse me, the power of 0 to a power of 2, so that seems to work. And if that works, then that's going to be 2n factorial. We did derivatives to check. Uh, let's do an integral here. We integrate this side with respect to x and integrate that side. What is the integral of the cosine of x? What has cosine for its derivative? Sine of x. <coughs> so how do we integrate this thing? Well, if it's negative, it's still negative, And if it's positive, it's still positive when we integrate it. So we want that to stay the same. I had a question about that at the end of last class, and I kind of had to rush out of here. Um, is that OK that, that nothing happens to that exponent? because we want the sign to stay the same. If we integrate a negative, we want it to still be negative. Differentiate a negative, you still want it to be negative. Um, how's this work? We're integrating, so we want to add 1 to the power, right? How's that looking, by the way? Is that looking like we want it to look? I think that's looking like we want it to look. And we would divide by, if we up the power by 1, don't we divide by that? And then we still have 2n factorial 
from the original denominator. So here's our integration. We added 1 to the power of x. We divided by that new power. That's how we've integrated to this point in time in this class. Not about to change those things. We like the x to the 2n plus 1. Can we rewrite the denominator? Isn't that 2n plus 1 factorial? This, if we wrote that out, would be 2n. What would be the next number in this <coughs> product? And then 2n minus 2, and we'd go all the way back to 1. And then we're multiplying that by 2n plus 1. Is that really 2n plus 1 factorial? It is, because we're going up 1 to get to the value to the left. We're going down 1 as we work our way to the right. So this is really 2n plus 1. And that's what we want it to be, right? Isn't that the sine power series or Taylor series or Maclaurin series that we generated earlier? I think it is. Uh, too, too many ideas are flying through my mind this morning, so I could, we can get us, I can get us to the point where I think we've hit everything we need to hit. Suppose we had suppose we had this, and then we'll do another example that is a little bit similar to this. So we know what the sign looks like as it kind of marches off to the right. Here's what it looks like. Now all we have to do is multiply each term by x squared. How easy can that be? Well, instead of the power each time being 2n plus 1, if we multiply every term as we march off to the right by x squared, now they're no longer 2n plus 1, they're 2n plus 3, and we're done. But we didn't do anything to the fact that it was positive or negative. We didn't do anything to the fact that we have 2n plus 1 factorial. All we did was multiply every term by x squared. So you can do that within the sigma notation. Or we can do kind of any arithmetic operations. Let's suppose, any questions about that? Because I'm going to take that one away to avoid a little clutter here. Let's suppose we had this problem. e to the x, we have a power series, taylor maclaurin series for that. We want to subtract some things from that. And then, as we did in the previous example, we multiplied everything by x squared. This time, we want to divide everything by x squared. We want to see what happens to this as x approaches 0. If we let x be 0 in the numerator, what do we get? 0. We get 0. And if x is 0 in the denominator, what do we get? 0. We get zero. So it is an indeterminate form, one of the kind of the standard indeterminate forms. It's zero over zero. We have a way of getting an answer to this. We could use L'Hopital's rule. In fact, let's do that, but let's also back it up with kind of the new stuff in chapter eight. If we used L'Hopital's rule, derivative of e to the x. Derivative of minus 1 and derivative of negative x. One. Negative 1, derivative of x squared down here. Two. Are we still in the same predicament? Still 0 over 0? Mm -hmm. Derivative of the 
top. Yes. Derivative over the bottom. Two. Now, if we continued to use L'Hopital's rule, we cannot expect to get the right answer. It only works for indeterminate forms. So I think we do have an answer now. Apparently, the limit of this particular rational function as x approaches 0 is 1 half. Now, let's validate this another way, this time using series. So we have a series for e to the x. What does that look like? X to the n over n. Okay, and let's generate a few of those so we can basically knock out a couple of terms. What's the first term of kind of the expanded version of e to the x? E to the x 1. Here's what it is. Oh, Isn't it x to the n over n factorial? Is that right? From n equals 0 to infinity? So x to the 0 over 0 factorial, there is that. x to the 1 over 1 factorial, which is just x. Okay, that's probably enough. What are we going to do from e to the x, or our expanded version, or kind of a Taylor series version of e to the x? We're going to subtract 1, then we're going to subtract x, and then we're going to divide everything by x squared. Help in the numerator, what do you see that we can do? Well, we've got a 1, and then we've got a minus 1. Let's just knock them out. We've got a minus x and a plus x. And then is it possible to take everything that remains in the numerator and divide it by x squared? What's x squared over 2 factorial divided by x squared? So 1 over 2. Right. X over 3 X squared over 4 factorial. So we're kind of losing 2 from the power, right, as we go. So the power in the numerator is 2 behind the factorial in the denominator. And as x approaches 0, well, the terms that have 0 in them disappear, and the terms that don't have 0 in them remain. So what's the result? 1 half. So another way of getting the same answer without using this uh, indeterminate forms. We never had any indeterminate forms here. We just subtracted those two terms, divided everything else by x squared. All the terms that have x in them go to 0 and we're left with 1 over 2 factorial, which is 1 half. So that could come in handy on that. I uh, don't know if this is enough time, but this is probably about the only thing that we haven't addressed. Oh, one more thing before we get to that. Uh, let's suppose that we wanted to take a sine function Not that you're going to have a lot of choice in that. Let's take a sine function, whether you want to or not. And let's do, instead of a Maclaurin series, which is centered at x equals 0, let's see what this would look like if we did a kind of a generic Taylor series centered at, I don't know, pi over 3. This is going to be a little odd because we've had this, although you have the repetition thing uh, going on, we had some terms actually dropping out, right? Every other term was dropping out. I don't think we're going to find that to be the case because we're going to um, evaluate the derivatives. Instead of at 0, we're going to evaluate them at a, which in this case is 
pi over 3. Instead of just x to the n, it's going to be x minus a to the n. Considerably uglier, but certainly possible. And what do we have down here? So we do need the derivatives. Derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. Derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. And we should be back to the start where we have sine. So with n equals 0, we get the original function at pi over 3. Excuse me. Yes, n equals 0. Sorry, I thought I said that the a value is 0. We're evaluating at pi over 3. If we were evaluating at 0, we would lose this term, right? Because this would be sine of 0, which would not appear when we're done x minus pi over 3 to the 0 over 0 factorial. First derivative at pi over 3, x minus pi over 3 to the 1 over 1 factorial. Second derivative, third derivative. So we're not going to lose any terms here. So it is um, actually going to be equivalent to the simpler version. Had we centered it at 0, that's not necessarily a problem that you want to undertake, is showing that they are equivalent. But let's see what this looks like when we center it around another value other than 0. So sine of pi over 3. Don't give me that trig look either. It's not valid on a Monday. What's the sine of pi over 3? Okay. x minus pi over 3 to the 0. That doesn't appear. 0 factorial. There's our first term. Kind of different, right? Okay, what's the next term? Cosine of pi over 3. One half. One half. Gosh, no hesitation at all. I like that. x minus pi over 3 to the first. Go ahead and put that over 1. n equals 2, negative sine of pi over 3. negative cosine of pi over 3. That's over 3 factorial. And we could continue. Clearly, a very different look from having centered this at a equals 0. But it is this equivalent to that function. Now, how would you do this? You would distribute the one half to the two pieces here. You would square this, multiply it by its coefficient. You can actually verify that they are, in fact, the same series. But it's just centered at a different value. Will centering it at a different value matter? I don't think we have done this yet, so let's set this up. We haven't done an interval of convergence yet, right? How do we do that? 
Ratio, 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 test. ratio test. And let's not use this version. Let's use the simpler version. So for sine, sine is an odd function. So we want x to the 2n plus 1, right? That's guaranteed to be an odd number. If you double something and add 1, it's going to be odd. So we want the limit. What do we put in the numerator of the ratio test? We're getting all kind of things reviewed that we've, the n plus first term. So we can leave off the negative 1, right, because we're taking the absolute value. I'm just going to leave that off. So this would be, it's probably pretty good that we at least got this started today. What's the n plus first term? Instead of doubling n and adding 1, we need to double n plus 1 and add 1. Is that correct? Don't we always put, unless it's the this type of term, probably shouldn't say always, but negative 1 to the n, that's just the sign, so we don't really mess with that because this is absolute value. But here, whatever we have done to n, we now want to do to n plus 1. So what is x to the 2 times the quantity n plus 1 plus 1? n plus 3. 2 n plus 3? Yeah. Is that shot, is that, does that seem right? That's how it should go when we get to the next term? We shouldn't go from 2n plus 1 to 2n plus 2, because 2n plus 2 would be what? That'd be even. So we want to go to the next term, but we want it to be an odd term. So a way of getting from 2n plus 1 to the next odd term would be go to two, skip 2n plus 2 and go on to 2n plus 3. So that seems to be right. And what about the denominator? All right, let's just set up the denominator, and uh, we're going to be out of time, and we'll just pick this up, as well as the error term. I thought for sure we'd get to that today, but I've been running my mouth. Any guesses? For interval of convergence, converges at a certain value only, or converges for all values? All values. All values? Okay. We'll see. We'll pick this up tomorrow at this point.